Good morning everyone, my name is Cleana O'Brien. I work in the scientific unit of the National Parks and Wildlife Service, which now sits in the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. I'd like to thank the EPA for their invitation to speak this morning. I'll be walking you through the current and evolving policy context for nature conservation, and I hope that'll help to inform your own views on what should be prioritised in the EPA's research strategy for the next two to three years. So just to set the scene firstly for the current state of biodiversity, well unfortunately it can be summed up in just three words, global biodiversity crisis. The next 10 years are widely recognised as being critical if we are to turn this situation around and this is reflected in our own current programme for government quoted here. We are of course also dealing with a global pandemic which for a while obviously overshadowed biodiversity and climate crises but I think it can be said that the pandemic has only served to highlight the importance of tackling the biodiversity and climate change emergencies, given the relationships between them. There are numerous policies, conventions and agreements, whether international, regional, European or national, that have helped stem the loss of biodiversity since the 1970s, but they have not added up to what was needed, despite of and because of the efforts of many. I've highlighted a number of these here. There are too many to list them all, one by one, and to explain what they all can and should do. And as you've probably noticed, I haven't included subnational or local policy responses that are worth a mention, such as heritage and biodiversity plans. For the purposes of this morning, I think the most useful areas to cover are those that are particularly influential right now. I'll start at the global level, then move to the European level, and then to our own national policy responses. 2020 was supposed to be the super year for nature. Several conferences were scheduled that were supposed to chart our course for addressing the biodiversity crisis for the next 10 years. And then, of course, the pandemic hit. Nevertheless, work is continuing apace to develop the CBD's post-2020 global biodiversity framework as a step towards its 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. It'll be adopted at the CBD's Conference of the Parties in May 2021. The CBD is emphasising the central role that nature-based solutions can play in the global recovery and that mainstreaming biodiversity considerations will strengthen economic and societal resilience and development. At the same time, the role of biodiversity in building resilience is becoming increasingly recognised, including in protecting against the emergence and transmission of diseases and with research even indicating a link between biodiversity loss and economic inequality. The importance of this is reflected here in the UN Secretary General's quote. The current draft of the global framework recognises the need for transformative change to bring these benefits about. The need to transform the world's economic, social and financial models so that the trends that have exacerbated biodiversity loss will stable by 2030 with net improvements by 2050. The 2030 mission is to take urgent action across society to put biodiversity on a path to recovery. It includes 20 action-oriented targets organised in three clusters. One, reducing threats to biodiversity. Two, meeting people's needs through sustainable use and benefit sharing. And three, tools and solutions for implementation and mainstreaming. Moving to the EU level then. The EU is hoping to lead by example in the run-up to the COP, showing broad ambition to reverse biodiversity loss and to ensure that a transformative post-2020 global framework is adopted. So as part of these efforts, it has announced the European Green Deal. It's a new sustainable growth strategy and action plan. It sets out a goal for the EU to be carbon neutral by 2050 and to commit to the net gain principle, that is to give back more nature than is taken. There are a number of supporting strategies, including the biodiversity strategy and the farm to fork strategy underpinning this, which has and the latter of which has the goal of making food systems more sustainable. To focus then on the biodiversity strategy specifically, the policy responses include proposals for at least 30% of the EU land and sea, respectively, to be designated as protected areas. For there to be an EU nature restoration plan with legally binding restoration targets, halt and reverse the decline of pollinators, reduce the use and harmfulness of pesticides, restore freshwater ecosystems, unlock 20 billion euros per annum for biodiversity and integrate natural capital and biodiversity considerations into business practices and decision making. Moving next to Ireland, from our recent report on the status of habitats and species that are protected under the EU Habitats Directive, 
the conclusion is that most Irish habitats listed there are in unfavourable status and almost half are demonstrating ongoing declines, as illustrated in the graph. The majority of species listed on the directive are, however, in favourable status and stable, although a small number are considered to be in bad status and continue to require concerted efforts to protect and restore them. This would include, for example, the freshwater pearl mussel. This graph shows the 2019 Birds Directive report results showing the short and long-term population trends for all 209 species assessed. The results showed that some bird species are at critically low levels, such as the Dunlin. 20% of breeding birds are in long-term decline, and the total population of wintering water birds has declined by 15% since 2006 and 2007. This graph is a quick snapshot of how species that are for the most part unprotected by the nature directives are faring. It shows the conservation status of their um, being assessed in accordance with the IUCN red list criteria. From the red across to the pink sections are those assessed as near threatened up to critically endangered. Green and blue are those considered to be of least concern or data deficient. For the most part, then, you can see in each group the balance is tipped in favour of least concern, but this is still not necessarily a good enough picture for our wider biodiversity interests. In terms so, of the pressures and threats that are acting on our habitats and species, there are a range at play. This graphic sets out the percentage of the annexed habitats that are impacted by various medium and high level threats and pressures. Agriculture comes out top followed by alien and problematic species, then development, resource extraction and forestry. For the species, um, it comes out as extraction of resources highest, then extraction of living resources, then agriculture and transport. For bird species, species specifically, the far-reaching consequences of decades of land use change and habitat degradation caused by various sectors, including agriculture, forestry, transport and development, are highlighted by the long-term declines of corncrake, red grouse, yellow hammer, curlew, red shank, lapwing and others. So what are our policy responses here in Ireland? One of the most significant is the National Biodiversity Plan, due to be updated next year, deliberately planned to coincide with the adoption of the global framework and the EU strategies, so we could build on those immediately nationally. We also published the Biodiversity Climate Change Sectoral Adaptation Plan, which includes a number of actions to improve our understanding of the impacts of climate change and biodiversity and increase our resilience. We are about to send the second prioritised action framework for implementation of the Birds and the Habitats directives to government for adoption. This includes a number of priorities for knowledge gaps that need to be filled and monitoring and research needs, as well as clarifying and prioritising the conservation measures that are needed in all our Natura 2000 sites. We're also working on mainstreaming responsibility for biodiversity across government, including the development of a biodiversity duty, which will help to ensure all sectors promote biodiversity and reduce their impact on it. And finally, there are plans for a citizens' assembly on biodiversity. So to conclude then, we need to continue to improve our understanding of the effects of pressures and threats on biodiversity. We need to avoid further deterioration and restore it wherever possible. We need to ensure climate change actions and biodiversity actions are reinforcing. We need to promote and upscale nature-based solutions to global and local societal and economical challenges. And we need to better account for natural capital in business practices and decision making. Ultimately, we need to deliver transformative change. Thank you very much.